As the storm pounded on the weakening hull, the stern sunk lower and lower into the freezing water. Three men looked at one another in fear. There was no way they were staying here. If they did that, it was certain death. They'd either drown or freeze to death. With clattering teeth and shivers in their spines, collectively they decided to take the risk and head toward the bow. They'd either find rescue or die trying. Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, my name is Eleanor. Just a quick disclaimer for our younger audience before we dive in. This story may be disturbing to some, so viewer discretion is advised. Okay everyone, let's get into it. Thank you to Neil Schuster for the suggestion this week of covering the Matafa Storm of 1905. It's an incredible story and only the second storm I've ever covered. With that, let's look at one of the worst November storms in Great Lakes history. To sum it up, the Great Storm of 1905, nicknamed the Matafa Storm for a particular ship that wrecked during the storm, was costly and quite deadly, and is one of the worst behind the Great Lakes Storm of 1913. Great Lakes storms, even if they aren't at their worst, can be some of the ugliest, most torrential storm systems seen in the United States. November storms, November gales, or November witches, as they are known, are the strong winds and heavy storms that whip across the Great Lakes in the fall, typically in November. It's caused by low atmospheric pressure systems over the Great Lakes that pull cold Arctic air from the north and warm Gulf air up from the south, and this creates huge storms and hurricane force winds that make the Great Lakes unbearable. SS Edmund Fitzgerald, SS Carl D. Bradley, and SS Daniel J. Morrell are just three infamous shipwrecks that fell to November storms, and there have been many that have sunk since then. The Matafa storm would be just one of these earlier November witches. Take some of the exact numbers in the story with a grain of salt. Meteorology has changed a lot since 1905, and it wasn't quite the exact science it is today. Hell, even today it isn't possible to entirely predict the weather accurately. But the Matafa storm of 1905 began as a storm system that formed on November 25th and was pushing through the Great Basin by November 26th and 27th of 1905. The forecast called for, quote, fresh easterly winds to be swept in with the storm during the afternoon and into the evening on November 27th, according to the United States Weather Bureau. In Duluth, Minnesota on November 27th, the winds reached speeds of 44 miles per hour by 6 p.m. that evening. This was a lot more than just the fresh easterly winds that were predicted. And so by the morning of November 28th, storm warning flags flew in the sky as an extra tropical cyclone pushed into southern Minnesota. An extra tropical cyclone, sometimes called mid-latitude cyclones or wave cyclones, are low pressure areas which, along with the anti-cyclones of high pressure areas, drive the weather over much of the earth. They are capable of producing anything from simple cloudiness to severe thunderstorms, blizzards, and tornadoes. They are defined as large-scale or synoptic low-pressure weather systems that occur in the middle latitudes of the Earth. They differ from tropical cyclones in that extratropical cyclones produce rapid changes in temperature and do point along broad lines, called weather fronts, about the center of the cyclone. So this storm system was moving across Minnesota and heading toward the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes themselves in the winter are usually warmer than the air around them, appearing steamy at times. This is normal for most lakes, but because of the enormous volume of the Great Lakes, they can maintain higher temperatures much later into the fall and winter seasons, causing even bigger conundrums when it comes to storm systems. This mix of cold and warm air feeds into storm systems, giving them the power they need to be destructive. And destructive this storm would be. While the cyclone moved across Minnesota, easterly winds and heavy snows had spread across Lake Huron, Lake Superior, and Lake Erie. Winds lasting a full five minutes reached 68 miles per hour in Duluth early in the morning on November 28, 1905, but the winds would drop below gale force by noon that day. During the storm, it was reported in Duluth Harbor that lake levels peaked at 2.3 feet higher than normal, which doesn't sound like much, but is worrisome. The storm system brought heavy, dense snows within the northern and western side across the northern Great Lakes on November 28th and into the 29th. 
This would keep storm warnings posted for the lower Great Lake on the morning of November 29, 1905, urging all to take caution. Though the Great Lakes area had to be careful during the storm, you're totally safe listening to this episode. If you're enjoying this video, leave me a like, subscribe to the channel for more content, and let me know down in the comments section below. With that out of the way, let's look at the namesake of today's storm, SS Matafa. SS Matafa was a bulk carrier steamship built as SS Pennsylvania by the Cleveland Shipbuilding Company in 1899. She was 430 feet long, had a beam of 50 feet wide, and a depth of 25 feet deep displacing 4,480 gross registered tons. In 1905, she was serviced by 24 crew, being long and skinny with superstructures fore and aft, and one single smokestack in the stern section of the ship. Her engines were capable of producing 1,800 horsepower, and she was similar to most steel ships on the Great Lakes in that her hull was made of large steel plates riveted to steel frames. Cleveland Shipbuilding Company first tried to lease out SS Pennsylvania, finding this unprofitable after a few months and quickly selling the ship to MSC. No, no, not that MSC, Minnesota Steamship Company. They renamed the vessel to SS Matafa. This ship had difficulties reported early on in her career with MSC, striking a rock in the Straits of Mackinac in her first season and arriving at Chicago with a leak. She even ran aground above the Sioux Locks on her way back to Minnesota. In 1901, SS Matafa became a part of the original Pittsburgh Steamship Division of U.S. Steel when the division was first formed. Though this was a great achievement, it was overshadowed a bit by the fact that she ran aground again on Knife Island Reef in Lake Superior on June 2, 1902. And the hits kept coming as we rolled into the November storm in 1905 with SS Matafa. She was on her way out of Duluth at 3.30 p.m. on November 27th, loaded up with iron ore and towing the barge James Nasmith. According to her master, Captain Richard F. Humble, it was around 5 p.m. when they were rounding the Apostle Islands in Lake Superior off of the Bayfield Peninsula when a nor'easter hit. A nor'easter, for our younger audience members and anyone who's never experienced one, is a large-scale extratropical cyclone in the western North Atlantic Ocean, and it derives its name from the direction of the winds that blow from the northeast. The crew in SS Matafa spent numerous exhausting hours fighting the storm, with Captain Humble deciding to turn back to Safe Port in Two Harbors, Minnesota. This was a pretty decent plan in my opinion, however, it would take five more grueling hours of fighting through the storm before the ship made it to two harbors, but they were met with another roadblock. It was too dark now to navigate into two harbors, and that left them with one option. Book it back to Duluth and dock there. As she neared Duluth, it soon became apparent that they were really stretching their luck trying to safely dock SS Matafa and the barge James Nasmith, so Captain Humble ordered the barge to be cut loose. After this, SS Matafa attempted to make it into the harbor unaccompanied. She got about halfway between the twin concrete piers when a backwater surged out, and heavy water slammed into the stern, sending her prow into the muddy bottom. Her stern was slammed up into the North Pier, tearing off the rudder and pulling her prow out toward the open water simply from the force of the water entering the vessel. After this, the stern swung violently into the South Pier, and she grounded into the shallow water just outside the North Pier, splitting in two. Her stern slowly began to settle into the water, and this left a difficult choice for the crew. When the ship split in half, 12 of the 24 men were in the fore section and the other half in the aft, with three of the men in the aft section struggling to get to the fore section. They're lucky they did, because the nine left over in the stern section froze to death overnight, with one of the bodies having to be chiseled out of a solid block of ice. The 15 men in the bow section were shivering, but alive when rescue attempts were made during the stormy night. However, it was too dangerous at the time, and the men had to survive into the next day. On November 29, 1905, a small rescue boat made it out to the ship, and all 15 men were rescued in two boatloads. Though she was the most notorious, she wasn't the only ship that faced disaster during the storm. We're primarily going to look at the perspective of the crew of the steamer, Butler. On November 26, 1905 by noon, Butler had emerged from the St. Clair River into Lake Huron, with the sky a slate gray and overcast. 
For the rest of the day, the ship steamed north across Lake Huron. On the Monday morning of November 27, 1905, the steamer Joseph G. Butler Jr. passed Detour Reef Light and entered the St. Mary's River between Lakes Superior and Huron. That afternoon, Butler cleared the Sioux Locks just behind another steamship, Bransford. Later in the afternoon, the temperature sat around 28 degrees Fahrenheit as the two ships headed across Whitefish Bay. The barometer began to drop, soon plummeting rapidly, and the snowfall picked up. By sunset, the lookouts could barely see the light at Whitefish Point as they passed the bay out into the main body of Lake Superior. Here, the two ships parted ways. Bransford headed north to hug the Canadian shoreline, aiming to stay north of the storm, and Butler turned southwestward to take the shortcut, pressing through the storm. Butler shuddered as she headed through the storm, though this shuddering would take an eerie new form as she sighted Caribou Island light. Waves continuously pounded against the hull and became interspersed with a violent quivering. In the engine room, the chief engineer must have felt the hair on the back of his neck rise as he knew the cause. The propellers were rising up from the water as a trough between waves ran up to 10 and 20 feet deep. The propellers would glimmer in the light as they came up from the water, and then the blades, still spinning, would plunge back into the water. This was dangerous because the shaking could open up the vessel like a cracked egg, and it soon became apparent to the chief engineer that he needed to stop the blades when they came up from the water and get them running as soon as they touched back down into the water. If the ship lost any progress, Butler could be at the mercy of the Matafa storm, but if the vibrations weren't mitigated, then the ship could just fall apart. It felt like a lose-lose situation as they neared the Keweenaw Point jutting out into the lake. The steward reported that the windows were out in the mess and there was about two feet of water sloshing back and forth. Butler would battle the raging lake all day on Tuesday, November 28th. At one point, the crew of Butler couldn't see land and feared they'd run into an approaching point, so they turned the ship to run along with the storm, trying to clear the shoreline. Late in the day, the storm began to calm, and finally the captain could see across the lake, spotting the light at Outer Island in the Apostles. They set a new course for Duluth, heading through high seas. Though the seas were still high, the wind was much calmer and the snow had completely subsided. She was roughly 50 hours from Lorraine when Butler pushed on toward Duluth, spotting Bransford near two harbors, also heading for Duluth. She sighted a second steamer ahead of the Bransford, and this later turned out to be Perry G. Walker, and she'd left Duluth just two days earlier. As she neared Duluth, Butler spotted more ships. The barge James Nasmith that the Matafa had cut loose was near Minnesota Point, anchored and sitting low in the water with iron ore and a thick layer of ice coating her. After this, Butler and her crew caught sight of Matafa, sitting in the shallows of Minnesota Point and split into several pieces. It was around noon when Butler steamed into the canal into St. Louis Bay, then spotting R.W. England beached on the backside of Minnesota Point, having fallen prey to the high winds of the day prior. In total, the storm damaged or destroyed about 29 ships, killing 36 seamen and costing shipping losses of $3.56 million $1905 on Lake Superior. The wrecks on November 28th are as follows. Isaac Elwood, and she ran aground in Duluth. Matafa, and she ran aground in Duluth. R.W. England, and she ran aground in Duluth. Crescent City, and she ran aground on the cliff at Lakewood, about seven miles northeast of Duluth. Lafayette, which broke up near Encampment Island, about seven miles northeast of Two Harbors. Manila, the barge of Lafayette, which ran aground at Encampment Island. William Edenborn, and she ran hard aground, breaking in two near Split Rock River. Madeira, the barge of William Edenborn, and she sank, breaking in two at Gold Rock. George Herbert, and she was smashed to pieces at Two Island, near Schroeder, Minnesota. George Spencer, and she ran hard aground at Thomasville. Amboy, the barge of George Spencer, and she also ran hard aground at Thomasville. Monkshaven, and she ended up on the rocks at Pie Island in Port Arthur, Ontario. William E. Corey, and she was stranded at Gull Island in the Apostles. Western Star, and she was stranded at 14 Mile Point near Ontonagon, Michigan. Coralia, and she was hung up at Point Isabel. Maya, the barge of Coralia, and she was also hung up at Point Isabel. Ira H. Owen, and she foundered northeast of Outer Island in the Apostles. 
Perry G. Walker, and she survived but had a badly damaged deck house at Two Harbors. Vega, and she broke in two and was broken into pieces by the surf at Fox Island. And finally, J. H. Althwaite, which was driven ashore and burned down at the Strait of Mackinac. That is a lot of ships to have been damaged or lost entirely. And we can feel a lot of love from our patrons. This episode couldn't be possible without our lovely patrons. Thank you all so much. If you'd like to support the channel and future episodes, go to patreon.com slash shipwrecksunday to join. Okay, let's take a look at the aftermath. As for the storm's namesake, SS Matafa was later refloated and repaired, continuing her career. She was still accident prone, however, and her next accident was on October 14, 1908, when she collided with SS Sacramento in the harbor at Duluth, Minnesota, sinking the Sacramento. On October 1, 1910, she was a hero as she rescued the crew of the New York after the ship had burned and sank in Thunder Bay, Michigan in Lake Huron, and in 1914, she struck a pier yet again. She did do a couple of rescues, which was awesome, and she was rebuilt in 1926 due to regular wear and tear. And in 1946, she'd be converted from a bulk carrier to a car carrier, then serving Nicholson Transit Company. She served them until 1964, then being sold to Marine Salvage to be scrapped. She was scrapped in Hamburg, West Germany in 1965, leaving behind quite the legacy. Her grounding had occurred just outside of Duluth, allowing hundreds if not thousands of locals to witness the wreck as it took place. The wreck of Matafa became so notorious that the November Gale of 1905 was then named the Matafa Storm, and the Duluth Cigar Company quickly capitalized on the wreck with the Matafa Cigar, featuring a picture of the wrecked ship. Along with this, the Split Rock Lighthouse was built on Lake Superior off Silver Bay, Minnesota because of the Matafa Storm, and it also spawned Vincent v. Erie, a case that remains a staple of first-year torts classes. Though the storm wouldn't have the fatalities that the Great Lakes Storm of 1913 had, it has still had a lasting impact on the Great Lakes area, and on shipping in that area as a whole. Rest in peace to the seamen who died during this storm. It must have been a cold, horrifying way to go, and I wish them nothing but peace in the afterlife and peace for their descendants. Thank you again to Neil Schuster for the suggestion. If you liked that story and wanted to hear something similar, check out our video on the Great Lakes Storm of 1913 in the cards. Stay tuned next week for the story of MV St. Thomas Aquinas, a two-go ferry that sank in 2013 with disastrous consequences. Thank you for tuning into Shipwreck Sunday, have a great week, and we'll see you next time.